In part one of this two-part video, I looked at PragerU's evidence that God and science are fully compatible, which was based on two premises, that life is up against impossible odds and that the existence of the universe is up against impossible odds, which, as we saw, could only be supported by changing figures and faking quotes. At the end of the video, we met the late Frank Pastore, who's going to give us arguments for what he calls God in part two. There are really four big bangs that have to be accounted for, not just one. I had never really even considered that before. I've never even heard of it. After all, the Big Bang is a term coined by Fred Hoyle to describe what we now know was the creation of space, time and matter from singularity. I can't find any reference in the scientific literature to three other Big Bangs. Since Pastore made them up, I'll let him tell us what he thinks they are. The first one we already know about, that's science. So let's start with what Pastore calls Big Bang number two. So how do you get life from non-life? How did abiogenesis occur? I mean, the notion that something can come from nothing. Where's the evidence? Well, you're going to need another something from nothing leap of faith, some kind of biological second Big Bang. Wait a minute. Blink and you might have missed that subtle change of claim. Let's rewind. How did abiogenesis occur? I mean, the notion that something can come from nothing. Where's the evidence? Well, the short answer is there's no evidence. None. That's why no one, except religious believers, is suggesting that life came from nothing. As the Latin translation of the word suggests, and Pastore told us initially, abiogenesis is life coming from non-life. Frank Pastore is doing something Eric Metaxas did in the first video with life and intelligent life, subtly changing the wording and making the two terms interchangeable. Non-life, which is what biologists say life must have come from, means simple chemicals like hydrogen cyanide, ammonia and methane. These must have combined to form nucleotides, the building blocks of DNA. In other words, a chemical process. Nothing, which is what Frank is at times trying to get us to believe biologists say life came from, means nothing. So researchers don't say that life came from nothing any more than researchers say the Big Bang came from nothing which was a similar claim Pastore made in part one. For all the mind-blowing advancements we've made in physics, biology, and chemistry in just the past hundred years, we're still no closer to making it happen. We don't have a clue. Actually, we're not only closer to making it happen, we've already made it happen. In March 2016, researchers at the Craig Ventner Institute did create life from scratch, a synthetic cell. It's an entirely man-made genome. I mean, sure, we've learned a lot about how to manipulate life forms, how to add and subtract DNA material, even map the human genome, but we have no idea how to literally create life from dead stuff. That's true, but scientists aren't claiming that life came from dead cells. Fentner didn't make life from dead cells and he didn't make it from nothing because that wasn't how life on our planet would have begun. Ventner made a living cell through chemical reactions using simple chemicals. And this isn't just a manipulation or copying of existing DNA. As I said, the Ventner Institute made a completely new genome from scratch. Another laboratory, the Scripps Institute, made even simpler self-replicating enzymes in 2009 and even watched them evolve generation after generation. Now, you can try to argue that this proves that life has to be created, just as the Bible says, and I could argue back that all it shows is that we can replicate something that happens in nature, just as we can replicate lightning strikes and atomic fusion. But I won't get into that argument because PragerU isn't getting into that argument. It's claiming this. We're still no closer to making it happen. We don't have a clue. The reality is that we were so close that it did happen. Next comes this. We still don't have a way to account for the great diversity of life forms. I mean, the huge differences between bacteria, plants, and animals. What? Scientists account for the diversity of life forms through a principle discovered by Darwin and Wallace called natural selection. Outside of PragerU, this is taught to school children all over the world. Nor do we have a way to account for the differences 
between man and animal. We still don't have an anthropology at this point. Well, that's news to thousands of anthropologists who've been collecting fossil hominid skeletons for over a hundred years. But okay, go on. So we're going to need a kind of anthropological third Big Bang to account for all this. Why? We already have a wealth of fossil evidence and DNA evidence showing that we evolved. Hominid fossils change over time from characteristics that are more like ancestral apes gradually to characteristics that are increasingly more human. As they progress, their brains clearly get bigger. There are obvious signs of bipedal motion, tool use and vocalization. So this wasn't a big bang, it was a slow evolutionary process that took about five to seven million years. Why would we need to discard this in favor of a belief that we all popped into existence in some sort of magical big bang, which has no evidence to support it? A final big bang is gonna be required to explain how a mechanistic animal brain can become a self-reflective human mind. Well, as we've seen, the answer is natural selection. You don't need a Big Bang for this, just billions of years of evolution. And again, we can see the development of the brain in the fossil record. Come on, animals don't do art and they don't appreciate beauty. Well, the obvious answer to that is, how do you know? In fact, animals do do art, they spend a lot of time and effort doing it, and there's nothing to suggest that they don't appreciate it. Or music. How do we know what's going on inside their heads? How do you account for free will and introspection, let alone man's pressing existential drive to ask why? Well, we're going to need some kind of psychological fourth Big Bang to account for man's moral and aesthetic sense I mean, his, his search for meaning, significance, and purpose, and of course, his appreciation for the true, the good, and the beautiful. No, once again, you don't need a brain magically popping out of nowhere. You just need millions of years of evolution. There's no mystery here. Mammalian brains have been getting bigger and more intelligent since mammals first crawled out of their burrows. The fossil evidence shows that the further along the evolutionary path you go, to larger and more developed brain power, the more introspective animals become, and the more free will they exhibit. Elephants go back to places where their ancestors died, just as we do. Dolphins can recognize their images in a mirror, and experiments have shown that if you paint something on their faces, they'll go to the mirror to check it out. And since they clearly exhibit introspection and awareness of self, maybe they are asking why. Who knows? Stan, these problems require bangs. I mean, sudden binary pops into existence, since there's no evidence for any gradual development in any of these. And again, PragerU's presenters can try to argue that the evidence has been misinterpreted, or that it's been faked, or flawed, or whatever. But if that's too challenging, then they can't simply close their eyes and shut their ears and tell students that the evidence doesn't exist. That's not only not how universities work, it's a breach of the Ninth Commandment that this university is endorsing. So, next time someone asks you, hey, what about the Big Bang? Make sure you ask them, which one? The cosmological, biological, anthropological, or psychological. And if anyone ever asks you that, you know what to say. Oh, you must have been watching a PragerU YouTube video. In fact, there was only one Big Bang. All the other processes took millions of years. And if they say, but PragerU told me there's, there's no, no evidence, evidence for any gradual, gradual development, development in, any of, in these, any of these, then you can show them the wealth of DNA and fossil evidence that's been published in the last 150 years and suggest that maybe PragerU knew it would be so hard to refute this evidence, they found it easier and more expedient to tell students it simply didn't exist. These are ideas students almost never hear. That's right, because it's not science. The idea that we should start teaching university students that everything popped into existence in four instant big bangs, which science can't explain, is the day we stop teaching science and start making up stories. We're still telling students that there's no evidence and not allowing them to even see the scientific discoveries of the last 150 years, that's the opposite of what education is supposed to do. 
A lot of people have written to say that Prager use other videos on politics, economics, philosophy and theology are very good, which is fine. I just don't happen to cover those subjects. The purpose of this channel, as I say in my channel description, is to challenge junk science being spread around the internet. So PragerU's opinions on politics or religion don't matter here. What matters are its misrepresentations of scientific facts. So to all those who like PragerU because of its political views, that's fine with me. I respect everyone's right to an opinion. But that doesn't mean you're obliged to buy the whole package and support its misrepresentation of science. That's true whether you're on the right or the left of politics, as we've seen in the many videos I've produced on this channel. Both left and right are equally capable of promoting scientific garbage. We all need to be willing to say that's not acceptable.